Welcome, welcome to my awesome Friday evening. You're listening to me, Heidi Hollis, the Outlander. So welcome to the show, everybody. It's going to be fun as always. Trust me. This show is about bringing outlandish and interesting topics to the forefront from aliens, angels, ghosts, demons, holy encounters, shadow people to Bigfoot to the outlandish. I always say if it's weird, we're here and now you're just as strange as I am. It's okay. If you don't know who I am when it comes to the outlandish, Personally, I'm someone who has been there, seen that, experienced it, freaked out, found some answers, wrote about it, got over it, and now I'm hoping to help others do the same thing and understand this wonderful, crazy, fun, fascinating world of ours. (laughs) If you dare, go to my main website, which is HeidiHollis.com, and you're going to find so much stuff there. I don't know if you can handle it, but it's okay. It's okay. I'm here. I'm here. And I have YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and all that other good stuff on there that you guys can connect with me by. And uh, I also want to tell you guys how you could hear this show. Most of you guys tend to listen to us through Inception Radio Network app. That's the IRN app. And it's fantastic. If you don't have it, you need to get it. And uh, you could also listen to us through iHeart, iTunes, everything. Anything and everything that you can think of. It's there, I swear. And uh, you could also listen to the show live by just dialing a number, like my parents, 712-770-8888. And I also always welcome you guys to call in with your questions. I know a lot of you are shy. It's okay. All is forgiven. But 1-888-919-2355. Or you could go to Skype, find MJ at Inception Radio Network, and pass your questions along there. Or go into our live chat room, which is starting to fill up like crazy right now, which is irnchat.com. And uh, I'll take your questions there. Just put everything in caps, then I can see it easier because I'm trying to do a whole bunch at once. (laughs) If I don't see it in caps, it's kind of hard to go through all those questions. So I want to tell you guys, first off, Thank you so very much for, my goodness, the numbers are coming in in regards to the Outlanders comic, and it has been phenomenal. You guys, I'm so happy you're digging my paranormal comic strip. Just go to theoutlanderscomic.com or right on the main page of InceptionRadioNetwork.com, and you will see the comics there. And, uh, man, it's it's been a wild ride. But... There's still more to be done. <laughs> so anyways, you know, it's so funny. I'm sitting here, I'm talking, and I'm getting messages popping up on my phone. It's just crazy. I'm, so if you guys hear little patings, that's, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> I have to tell you what we are going to do for the first 30 minutes. I am trying to stay more consistent in doing the outlandish corner. Yes, because my inbox is overflowing So what is the outlandish corner? That is where I take your comments, your questions, your emails of anything and everything out of the ordinary that you're experiencing out there and need advice on. And I will do my best to give you some advice without a guru or psychic mentality because I don't have either. (laughs) So I welcome you to write me through my main website, HeidiHollis.com or DASDASOutlander at gmail.com. And I welcome people to go to my Facebook page to send me messages, but guess what Facebook likes to do? They like to filter messages if you're not my friend, and then it piles up in this cesspool of filtered messages, and I don't get them. And yeah, I have had years and years of backlog, let me tell you. I'm just like, I don't know if I'll ever get through them all. I didn't know they were sitting there. So anyways, I'm going to invite my guest, who's going to be talking after we go through this lovely barrage of emails, but Joseph Selby is going to join me. He's the author of Physics of God, and I thought it'd be cool to have him join me on the, the email questions here. How are you doing there, Joseph? Doing great, Heidi. All Looking right. forward to some, some interesting questions. Oh, boy. This is, um, I, I don't read these ahead of time, just so you know. Just so you know. And so they could range from anything from angels to aliens. And yeah, this is, we'll see. Okay. (laughs) This one says, Dear Heidi, I have a question. About five years ago, I was seeing a man that just kind of hung around on the street in front of our house. 
I asked my girls, then 22 and 11, if they had seen anything, anyone. They both saw the same man. The younger saw him about a block away while on her bike. The older knew he was always out front just observing. When he showed up at my job one time, only a few feet from me, gosh, it sounds like a stalker, watching what I was doing. I directly told him he was not welcome nor wanted and to stay away from me, my house, and my family. You talked about hat man. This guy never wore any hat. He was always in a suit, very broad in the chest and shoulders. Hair combed back on his head, wore sunglasses, always kind of smug, like he was trying to be approachable, but it was fake. The weird thing was, all his coloring, clothes, hair, even glasses were like a soft gray silver. Huh. No real identifiable facial features. Me, my whole family, bound the house down to the four corners of the property, and I haven't seen him, nor have the girls. So what the hazel was that? She said the bad word, though. Um, <laughs> ooh, okay. Um, I'll, I'll take this first, uh, and then I'll, I'll see what you think of that one, Joseph. I, I, you know, I have heard of these more gray, like, uh, I don't know, spooky like guys hanging around and when you say silver and and grayish it, it makes me think alien sometimes but then you blessed your property and it stayed away so you know i'm of the notion that evil is evil and <laughs> if you if it takes having to pray over something to protect it to put the good positive vibes out there then you know what's it matter what exactly what it was you got rid of it and that's a good thing. So I, I don't think there's some things just exist without being able to define it always, science or not. And uh, speaking of which, we're going to be talking about some of that later. <laughs> but it's like I don't think that uh, we always have to pinpoint and, and define and say, there it is, that's what it is. And then we feel better. I don't think we always feel better. I think sometimes we could confuse things and cross odd lines that, I don't know, it just gets kind of gray, literally. So what do you think of that one, Joseph? That was a little different. That's a little different. <laughs> uh, I would. I agree with you, though. I don't think we can always know. I think there's a lot more mystery than we'll ever be able to solve. But she did the right thing. She went to, you know, prayer and inner protection, and that's that's maybe the lesson right there for her. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly. So hey, I think any positive uh, vibes can oppose darkness so all right the next email i have here it says uh, dear heidi i'm in your shadow people group and i have a question i have a 19 year old daughter who just told me she is having sleep paralysis i really didn't say much to her as i didn't want to scare her or give her any ideas as to what it could be but it does worry me her room happens to be where my husband and i saw the hat man like 20 years ago oh great we haven't had any problems, and life seems to be going well, but wondering what I can do to help her without saying too much. As a teenage girl, she can at times overact, if you know what I mean. <laughs> She's also adopted and is not settled in herself yet. As far as I know, she is doing well, working and going to college. Things are going better for her now than they were in high school, so I was kind of surprised when she mentioned she was having trouble. She didn't seem to be scared, but said she gets paralyzed and it feels like something is in the room but she didn't see what or who it was i'll i'll explain something real quick joseph i don't know if you're familiar with this hat man character but there's a man in a three-piece suit trench coat sometimes sometimes a a cape and he wears a gaucho hat or, or a big top hat and i coined the term hat man and people see him in broad daylight walking down the street in their house in their bedrooms and if they see his eyes, they are usually glowing red, and they feel like they have looked at the devil himself. And uh, so when this lady says 20 years earlier she saw the hat man in this bedroom, I'm like, holy smokes, you know. And he causes paralysis sometimes on his victims, but not always. So um, in reading this, I'm like, ooh, you know, tell, tell the girl to bless her room, you know, and without, you know, just saying, gee, honey, I would like to really want to cleanse the house. That's what I would tell her. And, you know, oh, here's a here's a cross necklace, and we're all going to join in, and we'll bless the entire house, and we'll just wear these necklaces, you know, just to keep it where it's on, you know, the down low so she doesn't freak out. I don't know. What would you tell her, Joseph? Well, I would probably tell her the same thing. I might also add that she might want to 
uh, talk to her daughter and see if there are other fear issues happening where mm-hmm. she's, um, you know, got some some deep seated things that may or may not be unrelated to the hat man idea or just uh, that she's attracting the hat mm-hmm. man with her fears. But at any in any event, whether it's a hat man or it's some deep seated fear about failure or life or, as she said, she hasn't settled yet into the reality of being adopted that, um, you know, address that. There's many ways to address it, not all with a psychologist, uh, but just finding out how she feels. Getting her to talk is the main thing. And teenagers are notoriously difficult to get to talk. But to get her to start sharing what's happening inside. So, wow, you're a natural. (laughs) Love it. All right. Very cool. No, that's really good advice. All right. So this next one, it says, hello, Heidi. I am Mara G from South Africa. My teenage daughter took a deep emotional dip and phoned me last night and broke down. She said that there is this voice telling her to harm herself and confirming all her fears. Like, I will take you to a place where nobody will find you, your mother will die, etc. She then said that she could see the voice. It was a dark man with a hat and a coat. Dang, it's the same creature. With his hands in his pockets. She was terribly afraid of him, and he instilled terror. He was always in a specific corner of her room, but also sometimes looking over her, standing at her bedside. One time when I sat with her, she started screaming as he was standing behind me, pointing a knife at me. It seems as if he appears more frequently when she is anxious. Could this be the hat man? I have not heard of encounters where he actually spoke. I'll I'll let you take this one first, Joseph. (laughs) How about that? (laughs) Well, again, I would say maybe the hat man is a symptom, not a cause, that maybe there are issues that need to be opened up and talked and sounds like she already started talking i didn't catch if he said how old she was um she just said a teenage daughter it seems to a lot of teenage daughter stuff today (laughs) well it's a it's an emotional time i mean it's also an emotional time for teenage boys but Mm -hmm. uh for teenage girls it can be even more difficult again there could be issues outside of this um you know in her school with her peer group in her in her family setting, so I don't discount that she's perhaps seeing a uh, you know some kind of disembodied entity, but the underlying cause could be that she's attracting it. Well, you know what I have to say, it's so bizarre, but all over the globe I have received emails in regards to the Hat Man and doing these these types of things where he he he'll insinuate kill yourself kill somebody or i'm going to do it and it's like it, all over the globe the, and these people are not connected and it's like well i know the argument of you know well this this could be you know incited from this and that and i'm like but how is it the same man they're describing in the same clothing it's like oh my goodness i i don't know how to explain that away to people except that you know i i never am shy to say i'm christian and it's like okay god is supposedly considered to be everywhere at once why can't darkness and why can't it take a form Uh, people say they witness jesus they witness mary and it's a recognizable form so you know it's the same entity well this guy doesn't change it up a whole lot where he wants people to know it's still him too so it makes you wonder, you know, why? Why is he, you know, he wants to be recognized. And, uh, yeah, I think, honestly, from all the, I mean, thousands of emails about this guy, that it is indeed the hat man. Um, yeah, and he speaks. He speaks. He threatens. Um, he likes to talk to people in their dreams, too, which is bizarre. Um, but he, he likes to growl and threaten. And, uh, yeah, the, the list goes on. It's a freaky, freaky thing. 
here we're going to be talking about God soon, and here we're talking about the opposite of God. <laughs> so it, it's a, you know, I always think, you know, for a lot of people that have no faith out there, that when you're looking into the eyes of just the opposite of God, it should be a lot easier to believe in uh, God, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I don't know. That's, that's, uh, I mean, that would, I would at least hope that there is an opposite force, you know? Something weird. Wow. Well, uh, Marajit from South Africa, thanks for that email. That was, uh, that was a doozy. All right, so this next one, this one comes from Jeremy. Hello, I started doing some research into shadow people and read a few things from your book. I believe I've had more than a few encounters with the hat man, as you call it. I'm really just seeking information on the specific being. I know it sounds crazy, but I've had objects thrown across my room and even been charged by this hat man figure. I wake up in the middle of the night at 2 or 3 and feel a very strong presence, but don't see anything when I wake up. I haven't seen this hat man in years, but I try my hardest to tune it out and ignore it, although the presence at night is still there. If you could give me any information at all about this being or any information on how to deal with it, I would be so grateful. Joseph, what do you say to people that are being barraged by something super duper negative? I mean, you have to get questions like that. You cover the topic of God. So <laughs> what, what would you say to somebody like this? Well, wrap yourself in, in inner light. There's a, an exercise you can do. It's very simple. Um, where you stand, you put your arms straight out at your sides, and you bring your arms together and touch your palms. And as you do so, uh, you, can, you can say anything you want, really. It can be, Jesus, protect me. Uh, God, protect me. Uh, there's uh, Om Tat Sat, which is a uh, Sanskrit mantra. And then open your hands up, move your arms around and bring them and touch them behind you and say the same thing, God protect me or Jesus protect me. And as you're doing it, feel as if you are building a, a cocoon of light around you uh, and, and seek that inner protection. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. I, you know, a lot of people, uh, it just, I don't know what it is, but it's like I am absolutely inundated and it's getting worse out there in regards to people experiencing negative things. And there's also a unprecedented number of people that are leaving the church, leaving their faith behind. And it's like, does this go hand in hand? You know, but sometimes it seems like darkness is attracted to the light. If somebody's really a bright light, that uh, these things are, come to them like a bug. Uh, so it's like, how do you tell... People, you're experiencing this because of A, B, or C. I tell people the only way they know is if uh, they know themselves, if they like to pet a dog or kick it, I always say. It's like, you know, I, and, you know, why this presence is coming your way, it's not so much a matter of trying to figure it out. Once again, it's important that you find a way to get rid of it more than anything. So, um, Jeremy, I don't know which one of my books that you're reading. I have a couple of them on the topic, so if... Uh, um, either of them tells you in pretty good detail on why these beings come and how to get rid of them. So I hope that uh, the information in there is, is okay, because it's hard to cram a whole lot into <laughs> a show versus a book. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> but I appreciate you writing the email here. Okay, so... I am scrolling through the emails. Everything is hat man and shadow people today, it looks like. I'm just going through and see what we can find. All right. Um, this is a big one. I don't know what's in it, but it, it kind of, we'll see. All right. Here we go. Take a deep breath, Joseph. <laughs> All right. Dear Heidi, we don't know each other, but I just stumbled on your site from Google. I can't seem to find your email address on your site, so I thought I'd send you a message here. Okay. I recently had a crazy thing happen to me over the weekend with who I now feel is, oh boy, hat man creature again. I thought it was I was going crazy and woke my husband up because I thought I was dying or needed to go to the hospital. She says, this is what happened. I woke up and it was still dark, probably around 6 a.m. I couldn't read my cell phone at all. All the numbers look like 1111. My arms and legs felt tingly like they had been numb. 
I couldn't see anything for a while, and then I started seeing diamonds on the wall and pink and purple sparkling stars on the ceiling. Oh, this is different. Then I saw a huge guy. He looked like a giant with very broad shoulders. It was just an online outline of a man completely blackened. He had on a long coat and an old-style hat, like from the gangster days. He didn't do anything, and I didn't feel threatened at all. When I told my husband what I was seeing, he asked if I was high. <laughs> That's a wonderful <laughs> sentiment to ask your wife. Oh, my goodness. I told him I didn't know because I sure felt high. It felt like ecstasy, although I've never done drugs. It's the best way to describe it. It was bizarre. I told my mom about this today, and she thinks it's something in the house. I've thought the home was haunted since we got it, but I think every house is haunted that I live in. I thought it was my medications playing tricks on me, or maybe I forgot to take my medicine. But my son just told me today that he sees someone in our bedroom. He sleeps with us and is three. He sat there and just stared at this person who I couldn't see. Sorry this is so long. Do you think this is something I should be worried about or any advice? Thanks for reading this, Emily. All right, Joseph, I'm passing it to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are definitely uh, ghosts. There's, there's no question that beings can linger in sort of the, uh, the astral level of reality, the energy, the, the subtle energy level of reality. Uh, I read years ago something interesting. Rather than being fearful or concerned to... Pray for that specific entity to move on, because no. it's generally it's generally that they're attached to something, that they died in the house unfulfilled, or the house holds some kind of memory for them, and they just can't let go. And to uh, to really pray for them to to move on, because they're just they're wasting time. They're wasting their soul's journey by lingering so long and to, uh, to encourage them to, to take their next step and to get beyond their fear, get beyond their attachment. Wow. Well, that's good advice. And when you're dealing with a haunting, that's, uh, yeah, because, you know, sometimes I, I, I can't help but to wonder why some of them are there. You, you'll hear stories of the person that lived there was such a good person. I don't know why they're haunting the location and scaring people because they're there. So it's, so yeah, sometimes I, I, I don't know their purpose, but yeah, that sounds like a good idea to pray for them to continue to grow with their soul. So that's, that's fascinating. Good advice. I, I you know, what I would say to um, this person that experienced this hat man, it seems like this is an ongoing problem for this person. And, they may be somewhat gifted. And everywhere I move to, I'm like, great, this place is haunted. But I'm like, hold on, maybe I'm the haunted one. <laughs> maybe I'm the one that's just able to see this stuff. And I don't think I'm a psychic or anything special. I think everybody's got these abilities to to see. And some just see a little bit better. And some of us ignore better because it's there. And uh, I had a ghost hunter come on once that told me, what's the purpose in getting rid of ghosts? They're everywhere. He's like, what are you going to just tell them to move down the street or step outside? He's like, you can't get rid of them. Just tell them to keep it down. I'm like, ah, oh, that's different. But <laughs> I'm like, okay. But um, I don't know. I just tend to feel that if I'm paying the rent and they're not, they shouldn't be there. So, <laughs> but, uh, so most, I think most ghosts are have no malevolent intent. You know, they're just... They're just confused. If they're a person, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, truly. I get what you mean. It, it's, um, yeah, you know, when it's reading this email, it, one element of this that's a little weird and funky is the diamonds on the wall, pink and purple sparkling stars on the ceiling. I'm like, I have not, I don't recall ever seeing somebody write about that and then have this hat man show up. But one thing to know, this hat man, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, he was tall. I'm like, this man is monstrously tall. He could be anywhere from 6 to 10 and 12 feet tall, people. And uh, I often hear he's about 7 feet tall or more. Um, so, yeah, that's it's kind of a crazy thing. But um, 
if you're a person wherever you move and you've got these weird things going on, I make a habit before I get settled when I'm living somewhere is to bless every freaking corner. I, I don't even mess around with it. I'm like, I know something's going to show up. They're not going to be like, oh, there goes Heidi. She's moved over here. Come on, guys. So <laughs> I put up my barriers right away and it's like, do not enter. <laughs> so uh, I think it's important to do that and to help your, your family and your, your three-year-old out to definitely uh, have them have the whole family participate in blessing the home and uh, you know take take uh, charge of it and uh, I think it's just really important. All righty, so I've, we've got five minutes. I've got a short one here, and of course, it looks like shadow people once again. Okay, uh, I have a question about a shadow person. I have one that lives in my house, mostly in my room and in the hallway. I could see him and hear him and feel him. One time I bumped into him, oh yikes, like you would if you turned a corner and someone was standing there. But he doesn't look like black smoke. He isn't a blob. He has no face. He is taller than me and he is there. But not like how I have read about. Is this a shadow person? Huh. Um, okay, I'm going to dive in, Joseph. Um Okay, so the saying a person, you see a person, but there's no face. So you're obviously seeing something that's rather solid and dealing with something rather solid. It could be a hat man. He doesn't always wear a hat, but uh, he's very distinctive and he's very solid. Shadow people tend to not be as solid where you can bump into them, for crying out loud. That's horrifying. <laughs> so, And why it's he's lingering near your bedroom in the hallway I, it, he waits till your guard is down when you're asleep a lot of times, and um, but it's not always. Uh, people he sits in the back seat of people's cars and you know tips his hat like a cowboy or something. It's really weird. Um, so I'm thinking it may be a, a shadow being, but I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to say. It could be a, a ghost even. So what do you think about that one, Joseph? Well, I think, as you say, it could it could be uh, it could be any of the above. It could yeah. be, uh, but she didn't say that she was fearful or paralyzed. Right. Uh, it could just be, as I say, some uh, some person who's died and is now living in their astral form, and maybe they feel some attachment to her now. Um, it, we forget, perhaps, that. These disembodied entities are people. They have personalities. They have a past. They have memories. Uh, they are people in all respects. They just don't have a body. Right. And right. so they may behave in a peculiar way, um, but not not meaning anything, uh, you know, negative or malevolent about it. So if she's not feeling fear again i would recommend that she just pray that this entity move on and uh not be afraid herself yeah yeah you know it's so funny i always used to say give me the biggest baddest alien versus a ghost because ghosts used to be people and they're quite nosy and when they're popping in the shower while you're taking a shower you feel a little bit violated <laughs> it's like hold on that used to be a person there. So I don't know what it is. I grew up in a haunted house. So I just had uh, I had this specific disdain for them and their presence. But um, you're right. It's like if it is a, a wandering person, which I believe there are some ghosts like that, that that are just wandering and aimless and, you know, or just uh, terrified. I, I have heard of people that, that are ghosts that are afraid they won't make it to heaven, so they won't go into the so-called uh, light. And uh, I'm like, wow, that's some serious apprehension. If you're mm -hmm. stubborn in this lifetime, you're stubborn in the next, huh, Joseph, you think? Well, if you, for some reason, really, really believed in hell, mm -hmm. I might hesitate myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that, that makes sense. It's like, oh, no, I'm not going there. I'm going to be judged. It's happening. Wow. I guess if you could run from the light and you know you were rotten or I don't know. It's like sometimes people just think they have to be perfect. And I I don't I will never understand that. God knew what he was doing when he made us. So well I, I am 
getting to our first break here and joseph you you hang in there you hung in there pretty darn good uh, talking about all this spooky stuff so you guys are in for a treat after the break we have joseph selby we're gonna be talking about his book physics of god you're listening to me heidi hollis the outlander and we will be right back Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to me, Heidi Hollis, The Outlander. Remembering always if it's weird, we're here, and we're giving you advice and insight on outlandish topics, and the phone lines are always open, but I know most of you guys are listening to us later on. So 1-888-919-2355. And now I get to officially introduce my fantastic guest who hung in there for a really fascinating outlandish corner. <laughs> Joseph Selby makes the complex and obscure simple and clear. A dedicated meditator for over 40 years, he has taught yoga and meditation throughout the U.S. and Europe. He's also been an avid follower of the unfolding new paradigm of science, and he is known for creating bridges of understanding between the modern evidence-based discoveries of science and the ancient experience-based discoveries of the mystics. Everybody, give a round of applause to Joseph Selby. Woo! We're all just, we're going crazy here, Joseph. How the heck are you? I'm doing great, thank you. Yeah, so that was that was fascinating. You know, I was like, hmm, physics of God, and his background is interesting. I'm gonna just slather on the paranormal <laughs> email to him. I thought that would be cool, and you, yeah, you're you're pretty darn good. So hey, <laughs> it's goodness. all it's all true. Yeah, yeah, honestly. So, my goodness, I don't even know where to begin with you because you have such a rich background. How did you even get interested in looking into oh, the complex and obscure? How about that? <laughs> well, my journey started uh, in the late 60s with some uh, basically hallucinogenic experiences that really made me have to rethink all my assumptions about reality. Mm. Uh, the kind of things that I experienced were uh, wonderful. I had blissful experiences, uh, not in, in every instance, but I had enough of them that I came to really appreciate that there's another uh, level of subtle reality that our... Uh, our science, certainly our science at that time, didn't really explain. So that sent me on a journey, <clears throat> and that journey took me to meditation uh, primarily and to another, another kind of inward trek, inward journey of self-discovery. Uh, and meanwhile, I never lost my interest in science. I always had kind of a a scientific mind, scientific bent, and gradually I came to appreciate in the last, oh, 20, 30 years especially, that science was evolving a new paradigm to explain what generally would be referred to as um, spiritual topics, spiritual um, subjects, paranormal subjects, and that the, the new scientific discoveries were giving space in the scientific paradigm for those things. So I became uh, personally fascinated with that, along with my own personal spiritual journey. Cool. Hey, you know, I remember reading somewhere that when it came to, like, uh, scholars of religion and beliefs and faith, that that they all got replaced with scientists, and we sent them ahead to go explain the world to us instead, and that's where people lost their faith, because they turned to the scientists. Is, does that kind of explain a, a little bit of the lack of beliefs out there with a lot of people? Well, I think so. I think science has had a huge influence because of its approach, which is the evidence-based approach to saying what is and what isn't true. And it was very difficult for sort of traditional uh, spiritual denominations, the Christianity and all the rest, to compete with that because its sort of fundamental position was that many things had to be taken on faith. 
what I liked in my journey and the reason why I ended up with such a, uh, a strong interest and experience in meditation is that meditation is evidence-based. When I have a inner experience, there's no question in my mind. Uh, there might still be a question in, in other people's minds, but <clears throat> there's no question in my mind that I've had that experience and that there is a responsive, loving, blissful, infinite consciousness that you can call God, you can call it infinite consciousness, you can call it a ground of being, regardless of what you, you know, name it, your experience is undeniable to yourself. It that's that is such a powerful statement because you know in, in juggling the types of things that I do and on this show and the other two that I do, a lot of people say to me, "Well, how do you know for sure what it was that you experienced?" I'm like, you know, there comes a point where I can no longer doubt my own sanity, my own eyeballs, and with all the thousands of emails I've ever received, it's it's like people often say, "I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me." I'm like. Are those the same eyes you use to drive back and forth to work and that you, you use to you know look up phone numbers on your cell phone? Why would they suddenly just start messing with you? It's the self-doubt that I think is a big enemy of people and stops their growth. Uh, I don't know how you feel about that, but this questioning nature of mankind can drive me nuts sometimes in hearing about it. It's like, come on, people, take a leap of believing in your own eyes. <laughs> well, that uh, what you're pointing out <clears throat> is really central to why I wrote the book. It's because so many people find it uh, difficult to believe that there can be a God, that there can be any subtle reality, because they think that science has eliminated that possibility, mm. and they don't want to. They don't want to feel foolish or they don't want to feel like they're uh, ignoring better advice and they get um, very nervous about even discussing subtle topics. So I, the, the main reason I wanted to write the book was to reach people with the understanding that there's tons of scientific discovery that support subtle reality that support the paranormal, that support the presence of God, but we don't hear about them as much because the kind of core establishment of science uh, is materialistic. That is such a crying shame. There are so many worse things to feel foolish about, like running on ice and then busting yourself in front of a crowd. You know, that's foolish. <laughs> <laughs> but to feel foolish about saying, oh my goodness, I think I saw something, and this is what happened. So many people go into these dark caves that they feel that no one can relate to, and they isolate themselves. And whether if it was a positive or negative experience of something out of the ordinary, and people get so depressed, they get suicidal. And it's it's sad. I, I witness it a lot. I, I I don't know. It's it's probably the biggest uh, problem I see out there. So I, I get why you wrote it. Yeah, a lot of people have said to me that um, after they've read it, that they're gonna they're gonna send it to you know half a dozen people that they know who they've had that kind of conversation with, where they they just can't bring themselves to embrace a spiritual life or a spiritual reality because of this barrier of science. And uh, that that barrier is changing, not just because of my book, but really my book represents a uh, kind of a concise expression of the new paradigm that is uh, is emerging. Definitely. And, you know, I'm starting to see this interesting disclosure from our own Pentagon, our own government, discussing the possibility that we are not alone. Well, that was exactly what they said on CNN. We are not alone, that Mr. Elizondo. And now they're getting loud radio waves from space. I just posted that on my Facebook. It's like there seems to be like 
they're testing the waters to see where people are at and if they can handle this other reality coming forward. And, you know, I don't know, they used to think that we'd all go running in the streets panicked. And I'm like, I've asked people on the streets, so did you hear the big news? Well, what's that? We're not alone. Oh, cool. You know, <laughs> it's uh-huh. like people are getting it. They're not panicked. They're just like, it's about time somebody said something. I'm like, this is cool. This is a cool time we're in, don't you think? Yes. I think we're, we're really going through some fundamental uh, changes, paradigm changes. My goodness, there's so much ground to cover and and you know, all of us who have been, you know, a, a bit poo pooed over the years, we're gonna be <laughs> the ones that the go to people like, please tell me what's happening. <laughs> so it's it's all good though, you know. Love thy neighbor. <laughs> so you're 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 uh some of the things that you cover in your book is one of my favorite topics, like near death experiences and the mystical experience. And you suggest that there are common roots of these two. So how do you connect the two? Well, well earlier we were talking about <clears throat> disembodied entities, ghosts, um, and the fact that they're stuck here. They're not moving on to uh, higher subtle realms. The reason they are still... Uh, with us, the reason they're still alive, if you will, is the same reason that there is life after death, which is that we have we have two bodies, in a sense. We have a physical body, and we have a subtle energy body. And when we die, we we drop the physical body like a like an overcoat, and we inhabit only our subtle energy body. So <clears throat> when people have near-death experiences, essentially they are, by accident, uh, uh, doing the same thing that a mystic does when they go deep into meditation and they become perfectly still and they are able to uh, transcend their awareness of their physical body and kind of let go of that sensory barrage of information. And when you do that, there's not nothing. There's a whole other reality of this subtle energy, subtle feeling of, of light, of love, of joy, of bliss. And when people have these um, near-death experiences, in a sense, they're doing the same thing involuntarily. They're becoming perfectly still. <laughs> they're becoming perfectly still because they're on an operating table or they've been knocked out mm. uh, by some kind of trauma. And in some cases, they also transcend that physical awareness. And when they do, they have these heavenly experiences. Some of them go very far into the experience to the point where they are in astral regions, they're in heavens where they describe these luminous, beautiful scenes that, if you look into mystic literature, is exactly the way they describe heaven. So it's the same experience, the same underlying reality is that we don't die when the physical body dies. We all have a subtle body and in fact, our subtle body is what sustains and informs the physical body. So you categorize, uh, I've had personally and have met others who visit this heaven-like place um, without trying, <laughs> just coming with these memories. Uh, I, I don't know. Sometimes it's from sleep. Other times it's just there. And then there are people who have these other experiences and other memories of not being in a very good place. And it, they, they come with these memories from dreams and whatnot. And so these are more categorized as a mystical experience. But are those usually sought to have happened, though? Or do they just occur to people like that? Like without, I mean, I wasn't seeking it. <laughs> I mean, how does that happen? You know, it's, it's weird. Well, I think it's innate to us. Um, I think there's also um, an element of your your karma, your your 
current uh, incarnation. I'm a believer that we keep coming back and working out our consciousness until we uh, attain that level of awareness continuously. Uh, so in a past life, someone may have evolved enough to have had their own mystic experiences. So when they come into this life, they're very uh, likely to have them again. And they might have them in dreams. They might have them in a uh, moment of stillness. But it's, again, it's all the same reality. Just people are having that transcendent experience for different reasons and through, through different means. Yeah, that's interesting. Is there a, a culture versus others that encourage or have experienced mystical experiences? Well, at the core of every major uh, spiritual tradition in the world are mystics. The mystics are the founders of the religions. The religions become less and less mystical over time and more and more organizational and more and more bound by dogma and the, the insistence that people uh, you know, accept one religious tradition over another in order to kind of perpetuate the religious tradition. But if you go back to the core, if you go and, and read carefully the lives and testimony of these mystics, they all say the same thing doesn't matter what religious tradition they're from. They all experience a consciousness that is much greater than their uh, limited consciousness they have when they're in their physical bodies. They all feel a knowable, knowing, conscious presence that surrounds them and penetrates them, uh, and that they're able with uh, practice and with discipline to have that experience when you know whenever they want, and they can uh, rise to those experiences of the heavens or even more um, rarefied experiences where they just feel themselves uh, omnipresent in all of creation. I have always felt like. The Prisoner Who Escaped Allegory of the Cave by Plato. And it sounds like you're describing that the mystics are kind of like that. The, the the ones that got out of the cave and saw what was actually casting the shadows on the back of the cave and was trying to explain to the the, the other prisoners, no, no, that's not real. <laughs> Over here is. Come out the cave and have a peek. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, the, that's what the mystics have been saying to us for millennia. And... You know, the good news is that eventually we will learn it. We will leave, leave the cave. Uh, it's, it's our destiny. It's much more, far more who we are than our physical bodies and our uh, emotional concerns of the moment uh, and our aspirations that only pertain to, uh, you know, this life. We're all divine. We're all yes. Uh, we're all gods in our in our own right. And oh, oh, I, don't, later, I don't call myself a god, though. <laughs> well, God, think of it as gods with a small g. <laughs> My goodness, well, it it's. Um, I think we do doubt the human potential way too much, and you know, even when people are faced with something utterly evil. And they're looking at it eye to eye, and they wonder why, gee, this thing comes at me all the time, but it never kills me. It never takes me out, though I'm fearful it will. It just doesn't. And I'm like, that's because they can't, unless you allow it to some extent. There's, there's something about the human potential, the power of the soul, and the spark of God in us that keeps these negative things at bay until we succumb to it somehow, whether consciously or not. Um, how do you feel about that, about there being negative entities do you, in, the, in the world? Or do you not sub, submit to that kind of uh, thinking that there may be evil out there? No, I think there are negative entities. I think there is uh, evil in the sense of beings, people like ourselves, 
who have become so confused, so twisted in their perspective on what reality is and what their potential is, that they live very, very dark lives. I don't think they are evil for all time. I think that you or I or anyone could have uh, experimented with that level of darkness and found our way out of it. So it's not permanent, but it's, uh, I think people get caught in fear, they get caught in subtle power, uh, but mostly, mostly the disembodied entities are are just confused. They're not they're not ready to move on. I okay, see. Yeah, it's um, some of the things that that come across my computer. Sometimes I'm like, "What the heck was that?" You know, I just you know, I I love that people are taking the step forward to have their voice be heard and to say, "I experienced this. Can someone help me figure out what it was?" It's it's fascinating, and it really lets me know that if anybody says they have all the answers, they just run from them. And that there's a lot to learn out there. That there are, I mean, what do you what do you think about there being interdimensional beings coming our way sometimes? Uh, definitely, I think if if you by that you mean that they're. Uh, Aliens, uh, not of this earth, then or parallel even that, universes, even yeah, or parallel universes. Even all of that is still the same principle that we have subtle bodies. So if an alien is coming who has never been to the earth, they're still using their subtle body to become uh, known to us, to to. Uh, be interacting with us. They have to work through this agency of subtle energy, subtle reality. Uh, in physics, there's the whole realm of what's called the bulk. And uh, in quantum physics, particularly in uh, string theory, there is this idea that our universe is really just a bubble in a vast sea of energy. And they even refer to them as bubble universes, and <laughs> that it and that it posits uh, string theory posits that there could be millions of other bubble universes in this subtle energy, what I call the energy verse, and the energy verse is two dimensional. It's pure light. It's pure energy, and it's only the bubble universes that are three dimensional. So with the right uh, understanding, the mystics are able to not only transcend their physical bodies, but they could roam that broader reality, that huge, vast reality of, of uh, two-dimensional energy and other uh, bubble universes. They could roam that at will. Wow, some people say I should live in a bubble and... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. You know, I I don't think I'll ever get bored talking about all the different possibilities out there because there is just, there's so many things I don't get. And, you know, I have to put this on record, and I'm curious what you suggest to people like my, like myself. When it comes to meditation, I, I suck at it. I fall right to sleep. I can't do it. I just like, you know, and I find that meditation and being in an altered state is uh, definitely a way of learning that we need. It, we do it in our sleep, but, you know, to be able to control it through meditation and, and to explore, I think it's so necessary. What what do you tell people how to even begin to do some meditation? Well, the main thing I tell people is that it's worth every minute of trying, that you're not going to be instantly able to have deep experiences, no more than you are instantly able to take, a, you know, play a new sport at a high level on day one. You do have to practice, but it is so worth it. If I could have one wish uh, granted, it would be that everybody in the world would understand how blissful 
they can be in meditation. It's just simply the most wonderful experience you will ever have in your life if you can stick with it and make it happen. Oh, gosh, I, I so wish. I, I'm unsuccessful with hypnosis, too, and it's like, ah, uh, you know, but I shouldn't say that 100%. I mean, I've had some odd successes, and uh, I don't know. I, I have to get your advice on that and how to do the, I guess, step one, step two, step three. Like, what are some of the, the good ways to go about doing that? But we've got to get to our break. You guys, you're listening to me, Heidi Hollis, The Outlander, and we will be right back. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to me, Heidi Hollis, The Outlander, and we have Joseph Selby, and we're having some really interesting conversation here. I was asking you about meditation, and I am a thick-skulled person. I don't know why. I can't do it. I fall asleep. But oddly, okay, I've had some successes, and one time, I don't even know what to tell you. I, I, I was like, okay, I'm really going to do it this time. I'm going to really meditate and see where I go. And I am not kidding you. I shot straight up into outer space and I'm going, whoa. And I'm just like hanging there and I'm like, I'm really here. And I saw like this red plasma, like stuff floating by. And I'm like, and I'm like, hello, is anybody, you know, it was the strangest thing. And I'm like, oh, that's what people say they can do. So is that common for people to have difficulty and, and to have weird success at odd times? I don't know. Well, I think it's very common for, for uh, people to have difficulty because it, mm -hmm. what the underlying goal of meditation is, is to help you become aware of things that are not your body and not your thoughts. And for most of us, that's what we're aware of all of our waking hours. So to, to learn to get beyond that is, is in fact a challenge. What I find most helpful is uh, for people to practice techniques. If you just sit and say, okay, I'm meditating now, it can be incredibly frustrating because, in fact, what you continue to do is what you were doing before, which is you think about things and you follow some train of thought until you've forgotten you're even trying to meditate. But if you do a technique, and one of uh, a very simple one is to watch your breath, and as you as you inhale, to say, "I am." And as you exhale, you say he or God or Jesus or peace or love, whatever you feel comfortable doing. And just with the inhalation, say I am. And with the exhalation, he. I am he. Because what happens is when you don't give your mind something to think about it thinks about everything yeah. so the technique is really helpful and it, it concentrates your mind on one simple thing sit still be as uh, you know kind of fight the impulse to fidget and to move and if you stick with it even for a week or two you will find that your breath slows way down and that you start to feel interiorized. It's a little bit difficult to describe, but you feel like you're, you're still in your body, you're still aware of your body, but it's beginning to relax and let go and release the normal tension that we carry in our bodies. And it's very, very... Um, nice feeling it's very very positive feeling you've got it's, a very calming voice do you do like audio tape to people <laughs> this <laughs> well i don't actually myself but um there there are many of them i can recommend a uh an app that uh, an organization i'm connected with uh just developed and it's just simply called the ananda a-n-a-n-d-a Ananda meditation app. You can get it on iTunes. You can get it on Android. And it is uh, full of guided meditations that uh, some of which are based on that 
that basic uh, technique I just mentioned. Nice. Uh, there's a question that popped up in the chat room by Trisha asking if you have to have any religious conviction to repeat this type of mantra. No, I don't think so. Um, you have to have some openness that there is something to experience. If you're completely skeptical, you're probably going to resist the the whole idea of relaxing into this other state of consciousness. But if you're at least just open to the mm -hmm. thought, and most people, as, as you were alluding earlier, many people have these kind of experiences by accident. Maybe they were at the beach and they were watching the waves roll in and suddenly they realized that, you know, five minutes had gone by and they had just been enjoying a very pleasant state of being where they let down and they relaxed. So there's a lot of ways that we start to uh, let go of our tension, to let go of our just uh, constant mental chatter. How long and do you suggest people first try it for? 10, 15, 20 minutes? Or? Well, I would say 10 minutes, but I would also say if you can't do it 10 minutes, don't feel like that's some magic number. Mm. If, you can, if you can only do it for five minutes, if you only do it for two minutes, do it, but do it with the intention that you're going to do it the next day and the next day and the next day. Mm -hmm. uh, because the two minutes will uh, only be a start, but a start is better than deciding I can't do this or this isn't for me. Just just keep working at it. It's really and then worth it. Other steps that come into it, like you start to visualize or focus on something as you get better at it, right? And then you can increase your time and aim for the stars if you want, huh? Yes. No, there's no limit to it. Uh, we're really talking about getting people over the hurdle of starting. But mm -hmm. once you get a taste for it and you uh, perhaps t uh, dip into things like the Ananda Meditation app, you'll find that there are a lot of uh, very moving uh, guided meditations that you can follow that help you, again, get out of your normal mm -hmm. thought pattern and guide you into expanding into space, expanding into your heart, uh, expanding with light. There's a lot of ways to, uh, to bring that experience to yourself. Nice. Now, we have to get into this title of your book itself says the physics of God. So there are scientific approaches to a lot of what it is that you put in this book. So how about diving in a little bit into that angle? Yeah, the, the heart of the book is really about how the discipline of physics, the discipline of um, biology, medicine, neuroscience, all have made discoveries that support subtle reality. They don't tend to get the attention that what I think of as the scientific materialists uh, put forward. But there's some amazing uh, confirmation of things. I already mentioned earlier about the uh, string theory positing this basically infinite ocean of energy that they refer to as the bulk and I call the energy verse in which there could be millions of universes. This is a very, very uh, good description of the way some spiritual traditions talk about heaven, that you have this whole realm of subtle energy that is basically, because of this connection to the bubble universes, is basically the, the seat of knowledge and information and intelligence that creates these bubble universes. So string theory, M-theory in particular, which is a branch of string theory, really kind of gives us a, a location for the heavens. It gives us a confirmation of subtle energy as a, a very real thing. It's subtle in the sense that it's unmeasurable 
in our physical world by physical instruments, but it nonetheless exists. Another area that most people don't realize with uh, science, particularly in physics, is there's a whole school of thought that is um, endorsed by a lot of very well-known physicists in the world of physics. Einstein was one of them. Um, Eugene Wigner, John Wheeler, uh, John von Neumann, Heisenberg. If you make a much of a study of physics at all, you can't help but run into these uh, people and their discoveries and their contributions to physics. Yet all of them believed that consciousness was an underlying reality to energy and energy in turn an underlying reality of matter. And that there are um, whole mathematical systems that have been developed, particularly by a man named David Bohm, that mathematically support this notion that consciousness is the ground of all reality. And the connection between the consciousness that is posited by these luminaries of physics and the consciousness that's described by the mystics and the saints and sages of all religious traditions is the same thing. The, the physicists are talking about it in a very impersonal way. They're reducing it to equations. And the mystics are talking about it in a very personal way as a, very, as a direct experience of bliss and love and an infinite consciousness. But they both describe how it's warp and woof of the entire universe in, the, in a very similar way. So this is what I loved doing in my book, The Physics of God, and what I talk about in, in uh, my classes and courses, is what is it in science that supports this more expansive view of reality? Oh, fascinating. My goodness. Uh, you know what? I, I can't help but to ask, while you're talking about these bubble universes and string theory, and I... You know, okay, there's infinite universes out there, potentially. There are some souls of people here who honestly don't feel like they're from here. But when people have these near-death experiences or these mystical experiences, they seem to ring kind of similar no matter what. Is it because of locality, like how close a certain bubble universe is? This is what this heaven-like place with the crystal buildings and all look like? I mean, is that just because that's our bubble we go to for these mystical experiences? Though I've heard of people, including myself, having odd little memories of, of other planets even. Yeah, well, the mystics say that we're drawn to a zone, a realm, a planet, an astral planet that uh, resonates with our consciousness. Mm. So like, like attracts like, but in the long journey of the soul to, to come back to full awareness of that infinite consciousness, we might have been drawn to many, many, many different uh, astral locations and that those, those are there within us as memories. They're buried deep because we tend to only use the memories of this life but they can come to us in dreams, they can come to us in, in moments of meditation, uh, because they're very real experiences. Yeah, so, and now you're of the belief too that say if somebody had a past life and they lost an arm, they may be born without an arm in this lifetime. Is, how does that kind of thing carry over, that it actually manifests? Well, I've never heard that one precisely. Uh, I can imagine a scenario where they lost a life, a lost an arm in a previous life, and came into this life with that fear that they would lose an arm, and lo and behold, they do lose an arm uh -huh. because because they're attracting to themselves that experience based on their their prior fear. But they do say that. When you're born, you're born with a certain DNA uh, 
potential of uh, that, that might determine some of how you look, but that if you have a, a strong personality, a strong sense of who you are, you might begin to override that DNA and look more and more like you did look in your last lifetime. Ooh. So if we say that's the milkman's kid, <laughs> they don't look like anybody in the family. <laughs> it's because they did it to themselves. That's what it yeah. wasn't a swap at the hospital or anything. Well, I can't rule out the hospital swap, but uh, <laughs> but you can. They have many many studies of identical twins have shown that some of them remain very similar in the way they look throughout their lives, but many don't. Yeah, many. Be- Many begin to veer off. They don't look so radically different that you wouldn't, mm-hmm. on looking at them, realize that they were twins. But they certainly don't look close. And in fact, one of the amazing things that has been discovered, again, fairly recently in uh, genetics, is that what it used to be considered that our DNA was fixed from birth. Uh, the DNA we were born with would determine how we were susceptible to diseases, how we aged, uh, what physical kind of abilities we might have, that that was all fixed. That whole uh, model is completely gone now. And they have found that we can activate DNA that we were born with, but was inactive. So we can basically turn on and turn off genes in our cells. So that's what twins do who who veer is that they have they have discovered that the DNA that's activated in one twin and the DNA that's activated in another twin can be very very different later in their lives. Oh, that is I you know, I know a lot of people that would love to know how to activate or inactivate some of their genes including the, the one that causes uh, certain people to be predisposed to become addicts, you know, or have high blood pressure. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. can, by, by changing your thought patterns, by changing your habits, by changing your diet, by including exercise, by doing basically any positive thing, and especially, I'll plug it once more, meditation, Yeah, you activate genes just by doing those things. And you not only activate genes that uh, encourage a positive health, but you also uh, deactivate genes that make you susceptible to things like drug addiction or particular kinds of diseases. So in other words, you're telling people that they should have a New Year's resolution to change your genes every year. (laughs) It's like Change everybody, those genes. <laughs> hone in on your genes, and just it, you do this through meditation and prayer. Then you're saying to say whatever it is, God, fix those, please. I don't want that. I don't want this either. Well, in a very real way, you fix them. Praying to God would elevate your consciousness, and elevating your consciousness would change those genes. There was an experiment uh, done with. Uh, men who suffered from, I forget what it was exactly, but they had a real medical condition that was not life-threatening, but would severely limit their quality of life. And they put them on a regimen of exercise, diet, that they all adhered to for about three months. And the end of those three months, they tested them, and they had activated 7,000 genes. Wow. Huh. So we a- we activate and deactivate genes every day. Oh, that's uh that's something I can say I've never heard of. <laughs> I just that's so and these are all the good genes. We we're, we're pretty certain that it wasn't uh Well, when we do positive behaviors, them. when we do mm-hmm. positive behaviors, we activate the genes that support those positive behaviors. Oh, I we dig do- this. When we do That's negative right. behaviors, we activate the genes that support the negative behaviors. The Neanderthal genes come forward. Gotcha. <laughs> huh. 
the knuckle dragging jeans. So we've got to focus. It makes sense though. It's like, Oh, there's so many sayings that are like, you know, what you do onto others comes on to you type of thing. And it's like, and it truly can from the inside out. So that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. So, We're much uh, more mutable than, than we tend to think. We're, we are not these fixed physical bodies, or put another way, these fixed physical bodies are not, in fact, fixed. I'll try to tell you a brief thing here. I know we have a little bit of t- only a little bit of time left, but... There are clinical studies done of people who are multiple personality disorder sufferers. Mm -hmm. And everybody pretty much commonly knows that these people have different personality types. What's less known is that when those personalities come in and the previous personality goes out, they experience physiological changes instantaneously. Scars, (laughs) scars appear and disappear. Moles appear and disappear. Oh. One personality was a drug addict and would have uh, needle tracks on his arm. When the next personality comes in, they disappear. Some personalities change their eye color. Wow, that sounds like possession. Well, in a sense, it is, because each personality that comes in comes in with their own subconscious mind and their own subconscious mind is full of their deeply held convictions about who they are, what they look like, what the state of their health, form of their body. And that conviction is so fundamental that when that personality comes in, instantaneously uh, makes the body conform to that image. I saw a movie recently, I want to say it was called Identity, and it was a multiple multiple disorder person as the main character, who uh, he and his uh, psychiatrist were trying to prove to the world that the different personalities were truly individual beings, and like one was diabetic, and the others weren't or something, and it was like, wow, you know, it was things like that, and and here you're talking about this, I'm like, oh my gosh, I just saw this movie on that, that's... um, that's really, that takes things to a whole other level. It, it lets you know that if we believe things strong enough, it, it can happen. And uh, I've witnessed that for personally, and I've seen it with others who fully anticipate something to happen. And, and I'll tell you briefly, I was, this was some time ago, I was playing video game and swapping between two different cartridges for the same game, Mario. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, one of the games allows you to continue, the other one doesn't. I'm playing, my friend comes in, she goes, ah, you got to start all over again because you died. I'm like, no, I could continue. And sure enough, the screen pops up and allows me to continue, though it did not exist. (laughs) It was the (laughs) strangest thing. And she's like, that doesn't happen. And it never happened again once I realized it wasn't really a reality of the game. Now, our minds are very, very, very powerful. We... We share God's mind. We share the infinite intelligence. We just don't use it very well. We We are his children. (laughs) We are uh, unaware of the fact that we are manifesting the bodies that we have. Yeah, and we change the environment. I mean, how could I have encouraged a game to do something? Just the weirdest thing, but... Gosh, we're coming to the bottom of the show. Your website is physicsandgod.com. And you have an event coming up in April uh, for people to go check out as well? Yeah, I have several events. Anybody who's in the uh, Sacramento area might be interested in uh, the uh, Healing Arts Festival that's held on uh, April 8th. Uh, I forget the location, but if you look up uh, Healing Arts Festival, you can't miss it. And I'm speaking on Saturday afternoon. Uh, I'll be in Seattle on April 13th and 14th. I'll be back in Sacramento on April 20th uh, and 21st. Nice. I I have a number of um, other things in the works. So, you know, please come check out the events if you are interested. I'm going to be doing a webinar series. So if you're not physically near anything I'm doing. This would allow you to uh, take a six-part class series as well as a uh, interviews with other scientists like Amit Goswami and Joan Borisenko. Nice. 
Wow. Um, well, <clears throat> that's fascinating. So go to physicsandgod.com. And I have to say, thank you so much for coming on the show. This is a lot of fun, Joseph Selby. And uh, we'll have to have you back on again. <laughs> yeah, please so, do. It's been my pleasure. Yeah. So you guys would come to the bottom of another program. Remember, you can catch me here every Friday at 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. You've been listening to me, Heidi Hollis, The Outlander. Remembering always if it's weird, we're here. Good night, everybody.